Welcome back, Dr. JC here one more time for week six. This is part three. We're going to focus entirely in this part on the unification movements in Italy and Germany. So let's get right at it. It's important to note at the outset here that both of these unification movements are linked. And they're going to be linked through a series of small scale wars that take place largely in the 1860s, a capstone fight in the 18 early 1870s and while it will be an impossibility to get real granular here hell i spend 16 weeks on just german and italian unification in another course altogether i am going to focus specifically on germany here this is not to diminish the importance of the italians we will come back to the italians to be sure in weeks ahead talk about dudes like benito mussolini pretty important characters but for the sake of brevity here, I want to focus, and perhaps importance, I want to focus on Germany. Largely because the age of Metternich ended in 1848. That's when Prince Clemens von Metternich was fired in the wake of those revolutions as a way to try to appease the people in Austria, German-speaking lands. And I also mentioned, if you will recall, that once Metternich was gone, we were looking for someone to start a new age. And that age is going to come from an individual named Otto von Bismarck. And thus, the age of Bismarck will begin. As it relates directly to the unification movements in Italy and Germany, the two individuals depicted at the bottom of this slide, Count Camillo Cavour and Otto von Bismarck, they are going to be the two movers and shakers that make this happen. Cavour will be acting as prime minister for his king, King Victor Emmanuel II of Piedmont, or a combined kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. It's colored purple on the map here. And Otto von Bismarck, working for his king, Wilhelm I, who's the king of Prussia. Both of these individuals, Cavour working as a prime minister, Bismarck as a chancellor, largely the same thing, meaning that they are the number one men, so to speak. For each of their kings they are going to use success on the battlefield to add to the geographic size of their territories and as i've mentioned in the past as the old military adage goes to the victor go the spoils and when you're on the winning side of military contests you usually wind up with more land it's exactly what's going to be the case here and italy and germany like other nations to include the united states are going to be born out of successful military operations. Starting first briefly here with Italian unification, and we'll move through this fairly quickly. Again, I mentioned that we're going to focus a little bit more on Germany here. I want to talk briefly about the impact of the Crimean War. While many of you may be familiar with Tennyson's poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, and associate that with the Crimean War, I'm guessing there's more than a handful of you that don't know Piedmont Sardinia's role here in the Crimean War. It was a war fought between Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire against Russia. And once it looked like Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire were going to get the Russians to sue for peace, that's when Cavour went to Victor Emmanuel and said, look, we need to commit Piedmont Sardinian troops here so that we can get a seat at the negotiating table, at the peace table. And that's exactly what's going to happen. An interesting point here as it relates to the Crimean War and Piedmont Sardinia's involvement and success there is that they weren't really looking to gain any land. Rather, Cavour, and by extension Victor Emmanuel, they were looking to go ahead and perhaps begin to make the case for the unification of Italy under the leadership of Victor Emmanuel. And the best way to make that case is to make it with the big dogs of Europe when you're at a peace conference. You're all sitting at the same table. So it shows the diplomatic skill and wily sort of nature of Count Cavour here. Real astute dude to be sure. And he's going to show an incredible knack at picking the right side when it relates to military wars and, or contests. And it's going to have a huge impact on the actual outright unification of Italy under Victor Emmanuel II's control. It's just going to happen. Piedmont Sardinia is going to be on the winning side of every contest. It's crazy. And as a result of the battlefield success of the four wars listed on this slide here, Italy will be unified under Victor Emmanuel II for the first time since the 6th century. Basically since the sack of Rome. Italy has not been unified. It is now. It's a pretty huge deal. 
Now, prior to moving on to German unification, German unification under Bismarck and Prussia, I'd call your attention to the last two wars on this slide, the Austro-Prussian War and Franco-Prussian War. We will talk about those here in a minute. But notice how the Italians are going to be working with the Prussians, Cavour working with Bismarck, to the disadvantage of Austria and the disadvantage of France. That Germans and Italians have a vested interest in helping one another out and unify here. And keep this in mind, this German-Italian cooperation will continue once we get into World War II, Mussolini and Hitler. So do keep that in the back of your mind. The cooperation shown between the two nations here will come back again and resurge and reemerge later on. But let's move next to German unification and the movement there. When talking about German unification, it's important to note here and keep in mind that Prussia and Austria have always vied with one another for control of German-speaking peoples. And for the longest period of time, we had that whole age of Metternich, yes? That was Austrian control. Well, once Metternich's gone, bada-bing, bada-boom, Prussia perhaps can insert and assert itself as leader of all German-speaking peoples exactly what's going to happen under Wilhelm I, the king of Prussia, and largely because Wilhelm I stays the hell out of the way of Otto von Bismarck and lets Bismarck go ahead and orchestrate this whole unification movement. If there's a master diplomatic chess player, it's Otto von Bismarck. While the outright unification process will happen quickly on the battlefield, it's going to take roughly about six years. That's it understand that there were steps towards unification that have been gone going for a long long period of time all the way back to Charlemagne or Charlemagne. Now I may have forgot to mention and it's a good point to insert it here as it related to Napoleon when Napoleon invaded across Europe one of the things he did when he went into German lands is he consolidated all these various German entities nobles kings several hundred of them, and Napoleon helped condense them into a much more manageable number, 87 at one point and then down to 36. And as a result of that, it did begin this process of German unification. Yet the unification of Germany under Prussian control really largely came from an economic sense. That Prussia pushed for the Zollverein. It was a customs union formed to manage tariffs and various economic policies within their various territories. And Prussia used this Zollverein then to gather together other Germanic states, form this North German Confederation, and they excluded Austria from this. So economic unity then can make this an easy leap or bridge to political unity. And if Prussia's more or less in control of the Zollverein, why not make them in control of political rule as well? So when Otto von Bismarck comes to power in 1862, second year of the American Civil War, the same time this Trent Affair is going on, which is going to have an impact on Canadian Dominion, and at the tail end of these opium wars that are fought in China, lots going on in the 1860s to be sure, but when he comes to power, he's going to begin to apply more conservative principles. The principle of realpolitik, which is the politics of reality, the politics of practicality. That's much more practical than ideological. And for Bismarck, looking back upon the history of the German peoples, the same peoples the Romans could not conquer, the same peoples that would sack Rome, Bismarck's going to call forth that martial spirit and say that unification's not going to come through fancy speeches and tea and crumpets with our neighbors. No, it's going to come through the application or use of blood and iron, blood und Eisen, and under Prussian leadership, under Bismarck's rule, yes, we'll do diplomacy when we can, but we'll also use the biggest, baddest technological stick whenever necessary possible. And understand German engineering and German innovation is going to be a key component of Prussian success here. Because they are going to be mechanically and technically more advanced than their neighbors. To include Austria, also German-speaking peoples, to their south. This going to have a huge impact on Prussia's and ultimately Germany's success.
We'll see that here next. Bismarck is going to help unify all German-speaking peoples by waging three successful successive wars. And in each instance, the Prussian military is going to have the upper hand because they have the most advanced weaponry. They have the newest rifles. They have the best artillery. And yes, there's great military planning, but the planning took place for several years before these military contests even started. Taking a page out of the playbook from the American Civil War, the first major battle of the Civil War, Bull Run or Manassas, it was a southern victory. A southern victory because the south used railroads to move troops from the Shenandoah Valley right to the battlefront. Don't think German military attaches who were with both the Union and Southern armies didn't take note of that. They did. Carried that information right back home and said, holy moly, we can move troops with lightning speed. Talk about a blitzkrieg in weeks ahead. So they planned these rail movements long before any of these military contests started. Bismarck had this all planned, ready to roll. And thus, while military planning is important, yes, technology and having the biggest, baddest stick also helps. Thus, Bismarck's first target are going to be German-speaking peoples along the Ulam Peninsula of Denmark, areas known as Schleswig and Holstein. These are areas that do contain German-speaking peoples. Denmark, going way back to the Viking Age, has always asserted a degree of control over them. Bismarck says, the hell with that, we want them. And in 1864, Bismarck, asking for aid from Austria, so Germany and Austria is going to go to war against Denmark here during the Second Schleswig War, the Danes really don't have a chance. Now Denmark puts up a heck of a fighting retreat up the Ulan Peninsula. They make a great stand at Dibbel, but once the combined weight of Prussia and Austria and the combined firepower of their artillery reduce the fortifications at Dibbel, the royal family in Copenhagen has no choice but to tap out. And in October of 1864 at, at Vienna, a treaty signed in this long-standing Holstein question is now ended. It's going to be returned to Prussia and Austria, German-speaking peoples. Interestingly enough here, it was the Prussians that led this fight. And Bismarck was able to gauge, in some sense, Austrian preparedness and the Austrian army's military capabilities. In some sense, he was sizing them up while fighting alongside them. Pretty wily. Utilizing the information he gathered during the Second Schleswig War, Bismarck in 1866 decides to do a little deal here. He talks to Victor Emmanuel down there in Italy. Victor Emmanuel looking to try to do what? Unify the Italians. One of the individual nations standing in the way of ut Italian unification is Austria. Austria owns some lands that Victor Emmanuel and the Italians want. Why not do a deal? They will. In this Austro-Prussian War then, also known as the Seven Weeks War, because it literally lasts seven weeks, is going to be really rough for the Austrians. Not only because they are technologically behind Prussia, but now they're forced to fight on two fronts. They have to fight the Prussians to the north and the unifying Italians under Victor Emmanuel and Cavour to the south. Never good to fight on two fronts. Definitely not any better to even fight when you're technologically disadvantaged. The major takeaway here, one of the great European powers, Austria, is crushed in seven weeks. And as a result of that, Prussia now will set up this new North German Confederation. They will exclude Austria, and all eyes turn to Prussia. Bismarck, however, has one other individual nation that's standing in the way of utter proper German unification. That's France. The causes for this Franco-Prussian War are quite complex. Let's suffice to say here that Napoleon III, who's in charge of France, will declare war on Prussia, in some cases because he's worried about Prussian military might and the balance of power in Europe. And once France declares war on Prussia, Bismarck recognizes he has an opportunity to bring the South German-speaking peoples, those that technically are more Catholic and thus more aligned with French-speaking Catholics than they are perhaps their own German-speaking neighbors to the north who are Protestant. So these divisions between German-speaking peoples are going back to the Reformation now. But he sees this as an opportunity to bring South Germans in along with North Germans and fight a common foe, the French. And in seven months, the Germans will capture Paris 
and at Versailles, the very seat of French historical power, in the Hall of Mirrors of Versailles, Bismarck will declare Germany an empire. There's a new daddy in Europe now.